coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. Like in my extreme things, which I test out, like I'll do um, what I call a fission sort of day or a couple of days. I've kind of played around with it. And this is where I might fast. I might do more um, interval training, uh, you know, even to the point where it's more hit like rather than repeat training. Um, I'll try to activate AMPK as much as possible to create more mitochondria to, you know, really um, get rid of the bad cells, you know, the autophagy of bad cells and do all these type of things. And then I'll have my, what I call fusion days where I'm trying to take my mitochondria I have, fuse them together, make bigger mitochondria, build muscle, um, you know, so I'm eating, you know, a lot those days, I might have more carbohydrates on those days, lots of protein on those days. And like, so I play with that. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interview Dr. Craig Marker. He's a leading kettlebell expert and a psychology professor at Emory University in Atlanta. As a researcher, he understands the latest cutting-edge research on fat loss, muscle gain, sports performance, and nutrition. So we discuss the importance of high-intensity repeat training, the effectiveness of a one-minute workout, along with advantages of eating seasonally, how to use kettlebell swings for a great workout, the correct work-rest intervals for fat loss, and how he has been able to look and stay young. This was a great interview with Dr. Craig Marker. I know you'll enjoy it. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the show. All right. Welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. And my guest today is Craig Marker. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. I was saying before we got on air that I, I loved your interview with Brad Kearns and the B-Rad podcast. I said, you know, I'd love to get you on because we talk a lot about nutrition in this in my podcast. And I, we, we talk a little bit about movement and I think it's important to get a little bit of both. So, um, I wanted to bring you on and you have some cool perspectives regarding, um, kettlebells, but also just about general workouts. And, um, maybe, maybe why don't we get into that first and talk about, um, like, I know you wrote an article and you, and you talked with Brad about your hurt versus hit High intensity training versus hurt training. Uh, maybe explain that to the listener so they can understand. Yeah, the, the title's a bit unfortunate because there's another type of hurt, H I R T type of training that means something completely different. Oh, so okay. I don't know which one is uh, going <laughs> to eventually go into the lexicon, but um, high intensity interval training. And I think of the some of the original work by Tabata. Uh, Marty Gabala is doing some really cool work on HIT that's very different, but I, it, I, so we can get into Marty Gabala's work, mm -hmm. but the original hit workouts were, um, Tabata came up with were 20 seconds on 10 seconds off. And the important thing was like all out intensity and he would go seven sets. And I, I'm, I know, you know, this stuff probably already, but, oh, um, good. seven sets, if power was maintained, the eighth set would take place. And I I've done this I've tried, I've really loved this. When I first read these articles, I tried it. Keeping power to that eighth round is really, really tough. So, you know, basically you have no rest, 10 seconds. So you're just like pouring everything out. So uh, I work with Pavel Satsulin, who is uh, kind of known for bringing kettlebells to the West. He's a former, um, he lived in the Soviet Union and did a lot of different uh, training there um, and came to the U.S. and brought kettlebell training here. Mm. Um, and so we were working on these different protocols and adjusting work to rest intervals. And uh, like with kettlebells, his training philosophy has always been, you know, it's, he's done a lot of training for special operators and um, uh, first responders that you always have to be ready to go. That we're never, you know, going to do a burning out workout where uh, and a workout, I'm using that term purposely, where you're not going to be able to go the next day. So he talks about them as training sessions. You're always practicing the skill. You always have enough in the tank to do it again the next day. Mm. And so our work to rest issue intervals, we we're playing around with it quite a bit. And we like this 
repeat type training that you could keep the power up session or um, set after set. Right. So, you know, if, if I, I can measure my power with a kettlebell by wearing an accelerometer, or if I had a, a jump plate, um, could measure that and how much power I put into each swing should be the relatively the same, um, plus or minus 20%, um, over the course of all my rounds. And so I can measure that and kind of see that. So that was kind of our, our hurt training. Then this is based in a lot of different models that, you know, really Verkoshansky, who's known for plyometrics, um, came up with this sort of type of training and kind of called it anti-glycolytic training or something similar in, in Russian, but basically not getting to that burning um, feeling that you have in your muscles, you might get to it, but then you're going to rest enough where you can get rid of the acid, be able to go another set. And a lot of track and field coaches use this. They do a sprint, can rest up to 15 minutes mm. and then do another sprint. So you're maintaining power on every set. So this long story, I'm sorry, I'll get around no, to the that, answer eventually. This but is good. Yeah, high intensity repeat training is being able to repeat the uh, what you do every set. Um, so and, you know, it, it's kind of like one interval type training is, you know, uh, 15 seconds on 45 seconds off. That's, you know, even tough to repeat for a while, but some of them we've even done longer, a lot longer rest periods. And, and Marty Gabala plays a lot with the different rest periods too. And so his, a lot of his research has got these very different rest periods. So. Yeah. And, and the, I would assume the rest period is sort of uh, context dependent, you know, on the person, their background and things like that. Um, w after I listened to your interview with Brad, I've, I've been wanting to get, you know, Brad talks about sprinting, um, as, as a great way to sort of, uh, get these intervals in, well, you know, I'm in Chicago it gets to, <laughs> it gets pretty cold during the winter. So I actually got a, um, uh, a rogue echo bike, you know, obviously you're familiar with CrossFit and stuff. So mm -hmm. that bike is heavy duty. <laughs> I'm and, 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 you know, it's interesting. I've been messing around with my, I, my intervals and, First of all, they have some, you can do custom intervals and then they have preset ones, you know, where it's like you mentioned 20 second on 10 second off. I don't know how people last. You talk about seven sets or in the, and then do the eighth. I, I couldn't do seven and do the eighth on those, you know, especially, yeah. you know, like you said, especially if you're going, if you're really committing to it and you're going all out, I, right now I, I've been doing 15 seconds on and, um, I've all, I've moved my rest period all the way to about a minute 50. Um, because I, I, like you said, you want to do your next one with that same amount of, at least right around that same amount of power output. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Yeah. No. And that, that's quite normal to have those longer minute plus two minutes plus. Um, yeah. And like I mentioned, you know, sort of the extreme is, you know, track and field, like they'll do, they'll start with a 15 minute rest interval. So they have the same power. They'll go even longer than that. So, I mean, yeah, that's, oh. it, it's, it's something that's really hard when I train people is like, no, I, I don't want to sit around a minute, two minutes, you know? And I, I think that's the most difficult part is just people getting their head around it. They want to just keep pushing. And so at the end of a workout, they're laying on the floor, you know, and again, if it's a training session, you're going to maintain that power each time. Um, if I can quickly say, like, I think yeah. that modality is really important. Like that echo bike. Oh gosh. I don't have one and I probably should get one, but I just hate it so much. Like <laughs> the rower was my nemesis for a while. And I just like forced myself to do the rower. I, you know, I think the rower is really good that, that sort of echo bike, um, you know, Brad talks about sprints, but the thing about with, with sprints, if you're doing it uphill, it works. But once you build momentum, like five seconds into a sprint, you're not, you're right. kind of trying to keep momentum. So it's a little bit different. I would love, I think a better would be uphills or a sled push, um, mm -hmm. you know, unless you're just trying to do five second sprints, um, you know, some, you know, and I think it's very body dependent, like my legs would burn like crazy on a bike like that. Um, and you know, that changes everything. So people have different, you know, you'll have a different output of, you know, your weak spot will be different on different modalities. Yeah. And the nice thing about the bike is you can see your outage, you know, the, the wattage and also how fast you're going. So I try to keep an eye and like, I try to push to about 35 miles per hour. If I can get it on that awesome. bike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know. I have nothing to compare this to. I, you know, I've never really done 
it with anyone else, but this is, you know, again, I've been doing it for a couple of months, but, um, right now I'm only doing four sets, four sets of 15 seconds. And, um, and then we'll see, like, like you mentioned, I think the more you get attuned to it, I could probably maybe in, I'm curious about your opinion is, you know, there's probably a point of no return where you could only do, you only want to do so many, um, uh, you know, seven or eight, I'm assuming maybe is probably the max. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And what you're getting at, like, um, Marty Gabala has a, a book, he actually, you know, he's done a lot of research, but he wrote a book, um, kind of a popular press book, and he calls it the one minute workout. And it's actually just one, I mean, there's two, three minutes of rest in between. So it actually right. takes much longer than one minute. But if you put in one minute of as much effort as possible over, you know, X number of rounds, you know, that's kind of what his aim is in that book. So you're hitting one minute. Exactly. So, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. Yeah. No, I, I tell people, I'm like, I'm like, just try it. I'm like, it's so great. Cause I've never been a big cardio I'm not a huge cardio fan. Like I know there's a people, a lot of people that go on a treadmill for 45 minutes or elliptical. Uh, what's your opinion? Is that just, I mean, I know steady state cardio has its place, but it, it's, is it somewhat of a waste of time? <laughs> I, no, I don't. I think, I think they're all important systems. Like the aerobic system is certainly important. And, you know, I, I think, as we age, and I'm kind of thinking a lot about longevity type of things, mm -hmm. you know, we're losing our fast twitch muscles. So this is why I like doing these, you know, sprint type activities. I want to keep as many fast twitch fibers and, you know, I weight train for the same reasons as when I get older, I want as many as possible, right. but aerobic work, um, the aerobic system is what's cleaning up the mess in between rounds. And so we need a good aerobic system. So I, if I'm starting somebody from scratch, I probably would have them do a good amount of aerobic base before they even start these sort of sprints. Um, just because, you know, they need like a base to be able to clean up the system. So I, I think it's useful. And I actually, I will kind of cycle through this high intensity repeat training and I'll do a little bit longer, like I'll do jump rope cycles, which is more aerobic. I can't get my heart rate up as high. So I'm doing longer cycles of jump rope and those type of things. So I, I try to mix and match because I will lose some of that aerobic capacity over time. Um, but I, I am trying to do everything as explosive as possible. Yeah. And I guess it also depends if you're I mean, I would imagine most of the people listening, were not like training for something specific. They just want to have general health and, you know, live a long, long, healthy life. So I, I try, I, you know, is there a certain amount of times, you know, you'd say to do this, like, I know Brad mentioned even just once per week, I've been doing it about twice per week. And again, it probably depends on the individual and their background and things like that. Yeah, no, I think you just said it there. It's, it's independent. It's what are your goals? And, you know, if you're, right. if your goals are to, to have more aerobic capacity, you know, three to four times per week, you know, if your goal is just to, to maintain and to kind of have some basic aerobic capacity, you know, one, two days a week is great. So, yeah. And, um, what about lifting weights? I know you, you, you know, you obviously you're, you were with, um, you strong first instructor for a while, right? Uh, mm -hmm. kettlebells what uh what it what, what type of I, I saw on youtube one of your uh one of your protocols um what type of things can people do with kettlebells that it can be effective as well yeah and uh, and it I can, this kind of goes with my main philosophy of trying to do things either explosive or heavy to build type two muscle fibers. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, like, I think kettlebells sometimes seem scary to people, or, you know, if you're in a kettlebell cult almost, and it's just another tool to me to use. Um, it's simple, like, especially during the pandemic, a lot of people were at home and to have, you know, a bunch of dumbbells or, you know, weight, other equipment, it takes up a lot of space. So a kettlebell is pretty convenient. Um, you know, I think there's a book by Pavel that's called Simple and Sinister, which is a, a really great protocol. Um, it's got kettlebell swings. And I, I think kettlebell swing, if, if I'm going to recommend one exercise for everybody, it's probably a kettlebell swing because it's working a hinge like movement and it's explosive. So it's just like jumping. And I think that explosive jumping um, is going to be helpful to most everybody. And then the other movement is a, a get up, a Turkish get up. So you're getting off the ground with a kettlebell in hand your body has to rotate, move in different directions with the kettlebell overhead. So 
you're kind of working a lot of core strength, uh, all kinds of different muscles in your shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah, it really is preventative of like shoulder injuries and different things for me. So that imbalance of holding a kettlebell over the head and the kettlebell shaking all over the place, um, builds a lot of a strength in my shoulder. So I think those are, you know, really good basics. You can do a lot of like I find presses work really well with kettlebells because of the natural positioning of the kettlebell on the outside of the arm. Um, I like doing that better than with a dumbbell or, or barbells. Um, so I do a lot of kettlebell presses. Um, and then, you know, other like gymnastic type of exercises. I like, like maintaining my pull-ups. Um, you know, I have sort of like goals in my head of being able to do a weighted pull-up with X amount of weight or doing a certain number of reps of pull-ups. I like to main, maintain those numbers. And then if I'm, you know, in a gym, like doing squats and deadlifts, those are really hitting a lot of bang for the buck with those movements too. What are your, what's your thought around? Cause I've, I've been lifting for a while. Um, and I used to just do a lot of traditional lifts and then the quarantine hit and I got into, uh, the X3 bar. I had Dr. John Jake on, uh, regarding like variable resistance and stuff. Have you, have you done any of that? And do you have any thoughts around that? I, I need to try that um, X3 bar. Uh, Brad mm -hmm. was talking to me about it and I, I was going to get one and I haven't tried it yet. But I, okay. I, I do think like, um, you know, that variable resistance, like I think it's one I need. I'm probably you're probably much better talking about it. So I'll let you kind of follow <laughs> up on this. But I think it's useful for some movements and, you know, some, you know, where that strength curve is important, you know, like, like a press, you know, you want the end of it to, you know, kind of, you want to kind of explode through it. Um, you know, I, I, there are lots of like overload compensatory type of training systems where, you know, you're doing a squat and the top is a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So having that variable load resistance is, is important to, to strain more at the top than at the bottom where it's the hardest. So, I mean, it fits in perfectly with some of those movements. So I, I, I definitely could see its utility. I, I I've done a lot of weighted squat or, um, squats with bands on them and, and different things or with chains on them, but it's, it's different than that, that tool that you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, no, you explained it perfectly. And, uh, I I've just gotten to know it over the last couple of years because I was just working on the basement and looking for something to just be a little bit more, I will say that like, just like my joints are so much better. I used to have some elbow issues and, uh, with, especially with doing presses and things like that. And the variable resistance, obviously as it gets, it gets more difficult, but you're also getting stronger because you're, you're more extended in a more an extended position. Um, so definitely a big fan of that. Um, I know you talk about, you have a bunch of articles on, was that breaking muscle? Is that the, is that the, yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So definitely check out breaking muscle. If you want to <laughs> read more of Craig's work. Um, and you talk a little bit about secret to building functional muscle. I'm just curious if you want to touch a little bit on that. That'd be great. Um, gosh, you might have to give me a little bit of a clue what I wrote in that. Article, <laughs> <'cause it's... laughs> I know. And, and I also, um, you talked with Dr. Fred Hatfield a long time ago, right? Mm -hmm. And he was known as what? Dr. Squat. Yes. So I'm curious, obviously I'm a big fan. Actually, I do now front squats with that X3, which has been really cool. Um, because I never used to do front squats. They're just difficult to get the right form. And, uh, now, you know, when you're dealing with the, the bands, it's a lot safer. Um, mm -hmm. so I really like doing that. It's a huge, uh, just core activation, um, doing front squats. So yeah, I'm curious to work with Dr. Fred Hatfield and uh, I knew you interviewed him a while back. So if you want a reminder on that, I can give it to you, but um, curious. Yeah. Oh, no. I, I mean, the, the things that he taught me over the years is just like, I, I that's, uh, invaluable information. I'm not going to forget that, but, okay. um, uh, real quick about the front squat. Um, mm -hmm. like, I, like you said, the band can be really helpful. Um, Dan, John talks about, uh, he created what, what he called the goblet squat. I I'm not sure, you know, I'm mm -hmm. sure people have done that before, but the goblet squat is with a kettlebell in front of you. And it kind of inverses a barbell, which people find really uncomfortable on the shoulders. The kettlebell in front of you is almost puts you in a really good position to be upright. And so like for people who are just learning to front squat, I love that sort of, you know, goblet squats and gets it just kind of naturally gets people into position. You ask them to squat without a weight and, you know, it can look not so healthy and not so great. But then all of a sudden they put a kettlebell right there and it just changes their center of gravity. They just feel much more comfortable. Yeah, I um, agree. I agree. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, Fred, Fred Hatfield had, uh, he was a, quite an innovator. Um, you know, the, the, what we were just talking about the, you know, he looked at the strength curves and really like, how do I make myself stronger and more explosive? Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was a big one in, you know, the top of the deadlift. How do I, you know, the lockout, um, how do I make my lockouts better? And, you know, just uh, putting straps around a deadlift bar, you know, so the, at the top, it's more difficult. And so then the lockouts would, you know, he could work on the lockouts that way or um, chains or straps um, or bands on the squat rack, mm -hmm. um, squat bar as he's squatting, which would compensate for the easier part of the strength curve, what we were just talking about. So those type of things I, I found, you know, to be invaluable, the way he sort of reverse engineered things and was always looking at how to um, uh, fix his weaknesses. Um, he also talked about this one I've, I've tried and I just don't, I'm not coordinated as, as he was, okay. I guess, but um, he talked about with the deadlift um, sort of this activation, you know, when we jump and this, this comes from Verkoshansky and his depth jumps, but when you land in your jump, your bodies, um, the, the neurons have a signal that uh, kind of tell the, the, the muscle is being stretched too much. We have to go the opposite direction. So it compensates for that stretch reflex mm -hmm. and you know goes in the opposite direction. So supposedly, and I, I'd love to see a video of this, I just have never found one. Fred Hatfield would jump up in the air, land, grab the dumbbell or, or the, the barbell and do his deadlift. And mm -hmm. Um, I, I've seen like Andy Bolton, who was the first person to deadlift a thousand pounds, do something similar where he's pumping his muscles sort of fast. And then on the third, you know, one he lifts and it's like, he's activating that stretch reflex. And so those type of things, mm -hmm. those little, uh, sort of reverse engineering of, of, you know, uh, going against what the body wants to do, um, were, were quite incredible to me. Well, just to let people know, if they don't know who Dr. Fred Hatfield was, he uh, he set the world record squat of, of over a thousand a thousand fourteen pounds in nineteen eighty seven, when he was at the age of forty five. <laughs> um, that's pretty impressive. It's, it really is impressive. Yes. Yep. Wow. Did you ever? So you met him? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. I, I know he passed away in two thousand seventeen. I think I was reading. Yeah. Yeah. He. Um, yeah. He was. He was pretty active until the end, but yeah, just, uh, I had talked to him, uh, pretty, uh, recently before his, his passing, but yeah, he's, he was so knowledgeable, always wanting to give back to the community and just, you know, really gave, um, the fitness industry, some really great information, you know, scientifically based, but also just a lot of reverse engineering of what worked. Yeah. It's amazing. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, I, I would tell anyone that's been doing back squats, especially as you get older, maybe look into doing some front squats. And if you don't have the resistant bands um, like I use with the X3, you can use, um, like you mentioned, like a kettlebell or, or even just a dumbbell and, you know, just hold it under your chin because um, it'll de it definitely, it, it not only are you putting less load on the back and the spine, you're, you're also got to keep your core tight the whole time and you're just posturally a lot better than a regular mm -hmm. squat. So tell me, Craig, so you, you look, obviously you look great. How old are you, Craig? I'm just curious. Um, almost 50, almost 50. Okay. Yep. Yeah. No. Cause, uh, I can tell you're in great shape. What type of things would you, um, like what tips would you recommend individuals as they're getting, you know, you know, obviously I'm, I turned just turned 41, you know, most of the people I would imagine that listen to this podcast or you know, 40, 50 and, and beyond looking to sort of stay in shape. Like what, what does your routine look like and, and how can people apply that to theirs? Yeah. I, so I'm, um, my day job is a professor and I teach, um, research and statistics. Um, and so I've always read the research literature. So I, I mean, I, I think I'm always reading what's new, what, what do we know and, you know, on, on exercise and nutrition and, and those type of things. So, you know, I play also do a lot of experimentation on myself and try to figure out what works well for me. And, you know, Which like you smart. said, there, yeah, there's <laughs> yeah. a lot of individual differences. So, you know, 
gluten free versus, you know, gluten full or, you know, those type of things. I need to test it out. Do I have that sort of sensitivity and how does it affect me? Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot of different experimentation over the year years. Um, I do think diet's very important. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if, if we're trying to get as much out of, um, ourselves as possible, you know, I think, you know, kind of the, the hierarchy is diet and exercise first, you know, let's get moving. Um, then I've got very specific ways of that. I find that moving works best for me and then diet, um, you know, really focusing on, you know, my basic principle is just natural, um, not processed foods as much as possible. Um, I play around with keto. Um, I like, Though in the summertime, I kind of feel like, you know, we have vegetables and fruits that grow in the summer. I feel like it's more natural for my body to get that. So I do less keto-ish diet in the, in the summer, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not trying to take in any processed sugars, processed fats, especially, you know, the, the sort of vegetable oils. I, I try to avoid all that that's in a lot of processed food. Um, so, and, and the stuff that you're talking about quite a bit, you know, in, in your, your website and your, um, uh, podcast, uh, you know, I kind of follow that sort of those natural principles, um, you know, and then I look at supplements and, you know, what can I do to enhance this even further? And I play a lot with like, uh, like I said, longevity and looking at what activates my mitochondria best, what mm. keeps my um, blood sugar, you know, um, optimize my insulin, you know, resistance, um, low and keep my inflammation down. So I try to look at, you know, everything that I'm doing. Um, and it gets, it gets a little crazy at times. I don't share these <laughs> well, secrets with many people, but yeah, I was going to um, say, if you, if you start researching supplements, that could be a, that could be a long, a long journey. What, what type of, if you talk about anti-aging, there, were there certain things? I know there's some ones that have come on the market recently and, um, there's certain ones that sort of stood out to you. Um, so the way that I have been playing with this lately is that I think of kind of two phases and this is overly simplifying it, but we have mTOR, which is sort of building muscle and, you know, building, um, you know, building our body. And then we have AMPK, which is, you know, comes in when we're fasting and, and, uh, exercising and our body notices an energy deficit. So I try, we have this sort of cycle naturally, like if I exercise and eat, I'll, you know, build M mTOR will be activated as I'm eating and AMPK when I'm exercising, but I'm trying to swing that pendulum a little bit more extreme. So like in my extreme things, which I test out, like I'll do um, what I call a fission sort of day or a couple of days, I've kind of played around with it. And this is where I might fast, I might do more um, interval training, uh, you know, even to the point where it's more hit like rather than repeat training. Um, I'll try to activate AMPK as much as possible to create more mitochondria to, you know, really um, get rid of the bad cells, you know, the autophagy of bad cells and do all these type of things. And then I'll have my, what I call fusion days where I'm trying to take my mitochondria I have, fuse them together, make bigger mitochondria, build muscle, um, you know, so I'm eating, you know, a lot those days, I might have more carbohydrates on those days, lots of protein on those days. And like, so I play with that. And, you know, I've done things like even on the, the AMPK days where I might fast, but I also have done fat fasting where I'll just eat fat the day and mm. kind of like, I there's been science on uh, like PPAR alpha, um, which is utilizing your body fat that stays active. If all you're eating is, is low protein and, and fat. So I, I'll play with that somewhat. Like, so I play with all kinds of different things. And, you know, I, I think shocking the body is good. I don't necessarily think it's something I want to do all the time. It's pretty extreme at times. And, um, you know, people, I, again, I don't tell many people about this, hey, that's... <laughs> these weird experiments that I do, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, I kind of play around with this a lot. That's great. I mean, yeah, you talk about like, uh, all like these hermetic stressors, right? Like fasting and working out. These are all stressors. Do you do any, uh, cold or, or hot therapy? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, 
you know, you I, jump I, in the lakes like Brad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brad, Brad has that to an extreme and like his uh, freezer that he has that's filled with water yeah. um, is, is great. But, you know, I try to do it a little bit more naturally. Like now I'm not in Chicago cold, but, you know, it's hitting like 40 degrees here. And so like I walked an hour this morning and just uh, T-shirt and shorts and, you know, kind of creating a little shiver response, nothing extreme. I'm going to keep that up over the winter. Like I'm building, you know, sort of things now, um, you know, January would be 25 here, 20. Really? Gets, again. So you're in Atlanta, gets that cold yeah. there. Okay. Yeah. In the, in the morning. Yeah. 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 It's, um, I, I've lived in Chicago where you're at and it's not, I wouldn't be doing the same thing. Well, <laughs> I'd have to build up to it, I think. But well, I think if I took my dogs for a walk with just a shirt and shorts in the middle of winter, I'd probably get some d interesting looks, <laughs> but uh, it, it would be probably a bit of a tough walk. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, and then the heat exposure, like I'm in Atlanta summertime. I, I try not to turn my air conditioner on in my car at all. I would do it at home and work, but nobody would want to be near me. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the car ride home, I've got 25, 30 minutes. That's my sauna. Um, if I stop at the grocery store, then people wonder hey. what, what, what happened to this person. Um, <laughs> yeah. You're in a sweat. But yeah, it's, it's, it, you know, I, so I kind of build these things in as much as possible. I'll try to do cold showers and those type of things at times, but um, I try to find those again, just taking the pendulum of what's natural in my environment and trying to make it a little bit more extreme. So I don't bundle up and I don't, um, you know, do excessive things to cool down um, in the summer. So, yeah, well, those are good, like little tips that you could do just throughout the day. Um, and then you talk about sort of you have your fasting days. I'm curious because we talk a lot about fasting. Um, do you do, are you doing fasting on a daily basis uh, or do you just pick maybe a few days during the week where you do maybe some extended fast and then you have days where you eat more on a normal schedule? Um, my, yeah, come my normal schedule is probably have a, at least a 14 hour fast almost every day. And that's, not, I don't know if that's even a fast, but you know, there'll be days where I extend it out to like 24 hours and you know, that's um, you know, maybe on Fridays is, you know, that's my extended fast where I don't eat until, you know, one meal a day the next day or something. And those are kind of just, that's just my general week, you know, 14 to 24 hours. Um, if I travel, like I find like that's the best time to fast, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause everything's different. I'm not, you know, don't know where I'm could eat and those type of things. So, <laughs> and plus I, you know, I don't necessarily want to eat uh, processed food. So it works out well. And there I can fast, you know, a couple of days and, and, you know, kind of, you know, every few months do something like that. But yeah, I always say traveling is a great time to fast. I mean, now we don't really serve you anything anyways on a plane. Cause you know, that's just not the way they do it anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. But either way, like you said, most of the stuff at airports and stuff is processed foods and, and you might as well just, fast right through it. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. And then as far as your work, your workouts, um, I mean, obviously you've been lifting for how long, how many, how many years have you been lifting for? I mean, I probably started in my teens. So you know, 30 years or so. Yeah. 30 years. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, what's your, what's your workout routines now? Um, I do mostly early mornings. Cause I, I find that just works better for me. Yeah. Um, I'll do, you know, long walks during, you know, afternoons or whatever, if, if I, you know, with the dogs or family and, and those type of things. Um, but I get up in the morning, like I've been doing my sort of fission days where I'll do a lot of like, um, now when you say fission, what is that? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's, it's not a good term. It's just, uh, that's my, um, kind of break everything down day. So like, I'm, I'm thinking of like the mitochondria, when I say fission, I'm actually like trying to split them to make more mitochondria and, and, you know, like AMPK. So I'll do a lot of like heavy bags work, jump rope work, rower. Um, again, I, I don't, I try to be explosive in my movements. I don't want to do anything. You know, I, I find like the heavy bag is great so that I can just punch it as hard as I can. Um, and I don't want to lose my power on those or kettlebell swings, you know, kind of the same thing. I just want to be powerful. Don't want to lose that power. Um, and however I work my work to rest intervals, I'm maintaining my power. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll try to do those. And then, you know, on, you know, two, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I'm doing a little bit more strength training, um, 
what I call my fusion days, fusing my mitochondria together. And then after that is, you know, those are probably my shorter fast days where I'll try to eat uh, two hours afterwards or so, and, um, you know, kind of feed the muscles and maybe take a little leucine or, you know, some things that um, activate mTOR a little bit more. Got it. Got it. What would you say? I mean, you've been in the fitness industry for a while. I know now you, you know, you, you've been a, a professor for a, a, a while as well. And you were at, uh, are you at Emory at university? Is that right? Uh, Mercer university. Mercer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but you know, all through your years in, the, in, um, in health and wellness, what, what are the, some of the things that like the biggest things that you've probably learned since what's it been 30 years or so? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, you know, some of the basic principles I have been, a, I, I think one thing I've learned is that things get reinvented over and over again. And, you know, I, I think of our, you know, the fasting protocol, Ori Hoffelmeyer, um, you know, kind of talked about the warrior diet. I think it was in 1997, he published that book. And, you know, and, and we've been talking about sort of um, uh, keto diets and, you know, Atkinson, you know, so like these type of things. Um, may not, you know, I, I think the refinement is great. Like some of the things that like now, like, um, you know, I think the Atkins diet, you know, like he might've even advocated for people eating bacon and, you know, all kinds of different things just to get fats. And now we know a little bit more about, you know, how, um, to optimize a, a keto diet and, um, you know, one meal a day type of things, what it's actually triggering. So I think we've learned a lot, but I, I think, you know, some of the basic principles stay the same. Um, you know, strength principles, you know, we look at, you know, what, one of the reasons I enjoy my work with Pavel Satsulin, um, he studied in the Soviet Union and studied, you know, all of these sort of Verkoshansky and all of these, uh, you know, um, USSR track and field and weightlifting coaches. And their world records, they changed weight classes for the, the um, weightlifting. I mean, they would still stand today if those weight classes still stood. So like wow. they knew what they were doing and those type of training methods have kind of uh, stayed over time as well. So, um, you know, I, I don't think, I, I think we're refining, but I don't think there's anything that's like super new that's coming out. Yeah. And uh, as far as um, I saw your video on YouTube, uh, doing some kettlebell swings and then presses and you talk about, I'm curious to just hear, uh, know your opinion about like myofibrillar hypertrophy and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, and... maybe put it in layman terms and just explain to people, um, the differences and how they can bet, how it could benefit them. Yeah. And I, I don't really know what's happening in my body when I'm doing this. So this is, you know, when I say those terms, I'm guessing what happens, but myofibrillar hypertrophy is the muscle fibers, um, getting, um, thicker and more muscle fibers. Um, and that's sort of the leaner muscle, like a special operator would want something that's not adding a lot of weight, but making them a lot more explosive, a lot more, uh, have a lot more strength. Um, the sarcoplasmic is something that bodybuilders are looking for just bigger muscles, not and, and strength comes with that, but it's the fluid and other pieces that are filling up the muscle. So I've never like, I'm sure when I first started, I thought oh, like bodybuilder type training, I wanted to be, I didn't want to be a bodybuilder, but I wanted to gain muscle like that. Right. I could never gain a lot of muscle. And, you know, I, I think there you're doing a lot higher reps. Um, you know, I, I'm focusing probably when I do weight training, you know, three to, to seven reps to build the most strength. And that's going to build the most um, fibers versus sarcoplasmic, which is, you know, eight to even 20 reps. And, you know, that's, you're going to feel a lot more of the pump. You're going to, you know, bring a lot more uh, fluid to the muscles. Um, you know, that type of training is just, it's just different. So with the kettlebell swings and that, that, that training that you're talking about, everything was explosive, but, um, you know, the, it was, you know, the presses were between three to seven reps and heavy presses, um, ex as explosive as possible, but three to seven reps kind of building that the fibers. Got it. So, so most of your weight training is done in that zone. Um, and when you talk about, 
you know, maybe 10 plus reps, you talk a little bit more in the endurance side, as opposed to what you're looking for, which is more just building muscle, which is would be like the three to seven rep range. Yeah. And, um, and building sort of that strength related muscle, I, I think, you know, eight to 20, you're going to build a lot more size. I like if you want to put on mass, you know, probably, you know, they, they've always talked about eight to 12 putting on mass, but I, I, I know that I think that range is even a little bit bigger on the high end side that you can really get the pump and burn, uh, you know, 15 reps or so. And, you know, that's going to put on a little bit more mass, I think. Got it. Okay. Not necessarily functional strength, but more the, the, the size. The size. Yeah. Is you think there's a, a point of no return as far as reps? Um, you know, cause I, it's interesting with the X3, he has you do one set to failure um, with like almost half reps at the end when you can't even press anymore. Um, and I've always was curious. I've actually, you know, I, I've, I was doing one, to, I've been doing one to two sets of that and I've been putting on muscle, haven't been sore once. Uh, what's your thoughts around like, cause a lot of people think they have to get sore to actually like build muscle, but actually the opposite could happen. You could actually damage the muscle and you almost sort of just go, you know, spin in your circle, spin in, um, in place. What, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. I, yeah. I don't think, um, I, one of the articles that I wrote that I didn't really mean it to be a, a um, I didn't know the quote would take off, but I, I wrote like, I don't care about your feelings. I care about results. And people feel sometimes like they have to be sore. Otherwise they didn't do a, a, a workout. And yeah, I don't think you have to be sore and it's probably contraindicated. Like, I think if you're, um, you know, some of the hit type protocols and even, you know, CrossFit gets a bad name, but I, it, I think it really depends on the CrossFit coach. Um, but like some of those training where you're always going, you're sore all the time, you come in the next day, it's like a, a hangover, you're trying to do it again. And, um, you know, that can lead to injuries over time, your body just isn't recovering. And so I, you know, I think there is mm -hmm. a point of diminishing returns. Um, I like that idea of being able to go you know, I might have a little soreness, but like, I'd like to be able to go and almost as peak performance relatively every day. Yeah. And the one thing I've noticed just doing, um, doing the resistance training and doing less sets and not being as sore is like you said, like I can increase the, the, how many workouts I do during the week, as opposed to just doing lower body once or maybe twice because I'm just cashed and I just can't do it again. And then I got to wait longer as a, uh, you know, I've, I've been doing, you know, like maybe three, four lower body workouts a week now. Um, and I don't, I feel like my output is just as, is, you know, is strong. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. I mean, I, I like that more frequent too. And I think maybe, it, um, as, as I aged, like, it's just like I needed to do it more frequently and I couldn't just do it all in one day. Um, you know, Dan, John and Pavel have a book called the easy strength and they're doing, a whole body workout. Um, gosh, I'm going to probably bastardize this book, but I thought four to five days a week, maybe that's just what I did with it. But, but it's that sort of that, that idea, that principle, you're not putting in a ton of reps per day, but over the course of the week, you've kind of, you know, have that volume. Yeah. I think Brad interviewed someone that, uh, was doing like, he had like a deadlift bar, uh, by where he would work and he would just walk every time he walked past it, he did like one of them. <laughs> um, you know, again, it's all, I think when you can, you know, when you talk about these micro workouts, uh, I think it, it, everyone can do them and there's no excuses. I think sometimes the excuses come in when you think to yourself, well, I got to drive the gym and I got to be there for an hour. So, you know, and then I got a shower. So then they, they end up not even doing anything. And mm -hmm. so <laughs> I think they can go a long way if you just can do a 10, 15 minute workout. And like you said, like the, like those sprints or the, uh, when I'm doing it on the bike, I'm, I'm really only doing a minute of output of hard output and the rest is just rest time. But, and I'm done after whatever, six, seven minutes. Yep. Yeah. I think you like in that, that mindset, um, you know, 15 seconds, like you, I, I feel like I can do, I can handle any pain for almost 15 seconds. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's at, if I think I have another 30 minutes, like it's, Oh gosh, that's hard to, mentally handle, but 15 seconds, I, I worry about the next 15 seconds after I finish this one, but I can handle 15 seconds right now. Yeah, I know. It's like, you look at the clock, you're like, Oh, okay. Like you're, I think, yeah, it's a total different mentality. Cause I don't like love. I don't even like riding a bike, but like, I just crank it out. And by the time I, if I close my eyes, by the time I open my eyes, I'm pretty much 
done with that set, which is good because I need to rest anyways. Um, it, one other question I'm, I'm, is- I'm glad to hear though that I'm not the only one closing my eyes when I don't want to see the <laughs> clock anymore. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, no, I, the only time I'll open it is I just want to see how fast I'm going. But other than that, I'll, I'll try to close my eyes. And um, my question too is, I know Brad's talked about a, a, a work uh, ratio as far as like 10 to 30 seconds when you're doing some of that high, you know, that high intensity work, is that sound about right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, 30, it, 30, 30 might even be even long, right? That might even be it, even too long. It, it is. Yeah. And it's kind of gets at energy systems and everybody has, you know, again, individual differences in how these things, um, kind of uh, play a role, but like, I want to drain, um, the lactic system, which is our quick system. And, you know, that starts to drain pretty quickly, like seven, eight seconds into it. And then the glycolytic system is ramping up that whole time and, and around, you know, 15 seconds or so that's starting to go. So it depends with, you know, so like, I'm still trying to find the exact right timing, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think, I think between 10 to 20 seconds is my pretty sweet zone. I could expand it out a little bit more. 30 seconds, you know, it depends maybe on some pieces of equipment. It just takes me a little longer to ramp up, but yeah, I, I think 10 to 25 seconds is that sweet spot. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, just not getting into the deep, too deep into science, but um, a lot of those triggers that trigger mitochondria biogenesis and, um, you know, what we're trying to do is drain that energy system, the ATP as fast as possible, because that sends out a signal to our body. Like, um, you know, we're running out of energy, you know, we got to go fix this system up so we can handle these type of things. And so you, yeah, like you said, it's that hormetic shock that, you know, we're just draining it as fast as possible. If you start expanding it out, your body will naturally, you know, switch energy systems and that's not going to get you the signal. It's going to get a different signal. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm also curious and your thoughts on this is, can this sort of translate into other things that you do? Cause like I I'm a golfer. I know we talk about Brad a lot here, but Brad's Brad, you know, I think he set the record for the fastest, um, hole. That's how I found him. The world record for the fastest playing the fastest <laughs> golf hole. <laughs> uh -huh. Um, but you know, I'm always, you know, nowadays with golf trying to hit it. I'm not like going crazy trying to find speed because I hit it a decent while, but you know, getting, getting speed this way and, and, and building up fast twitch muscles, muscles, I'm, I'm assuming this could be a crossover into other, F, F, you know, athletic endeavors. Oh, I, I definitely think so. Yeah. I mean, I think the, you know, you're kind of forcing the body to adapt in different ways. Like I said, the aerobic system just kicks in to clean up the mess. So you're building your aerobic system without even, you know, like you said, doing those long, um, in, long rest periods. And that was the most fascinating part about the Tabata original research was his four minute protocol. People were doing as well on a 5k run as they were practicing 5k runs all the time. Um, so that, you know, just four minutes versus, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes of running, it was the same sort of building up the aerobic system. So Cool. Wow. And so if, uh, uh, just to summarize, uh, if people want to get into sort of this um, high intensity repeat training, right? Um, you know, something quick, fast twitch, it could be like we mentioned on a bike, even a kettlebell. Could you do? Yeah. Kettlebell, kettlebell yeah, swings. Yeah. Yep. Um, and you want to do, let's just say anywhere from, let's just say seven seconds to 20 seconds of work time. And then rest time would be you know, depending on the individual, uh, you want to probably take that work interval and times it by maybe five to 10 times that. Yep. That seems reasonable. Yeah. Yep. So like, um, and then, but you want to make sure that that work, that rest time is enough so that you can come back and give that same output the next time. Exactly. Yep. And, and then let's just say maybe four to, at the most 10 reps of it. <laughs> is yeah it, it probably yeah, depends on the oh four, yeah, four, i'm sorry uh, four, four to ten four, rounds four to yes, ten yep. rounds yes yep. is what i'm saying okay yeah yep um and it depends on how intense it is you know if it's you know like you said that uh, um that bike echo bike um it's intense because it's getting your legs your arms everything it's hard to keep that power up you know something 
Hash forward is a, a different one that's not as intense. You know, like a sled push, maybe, you know, you're going to hit all the lower legs. Maybe you can do more of those or something, you know, and it, it, again, it's or a be, rower or even a rower, maybe a rower. Yep. Yeah. yep. It's going to be individual, individualized. Some people are just going to have, um, you know, the ratios of type one to type two fibers are going to be different in different parts of the body. So awesome. Well, the a lot of good information. Um, maybe before we end, I, I like to ask this question and I sort of asked it to you earlier, but maybe if you'd give one tip to someone getting up into their, you know, 50s, 60s and beyond, uh, what one tip would you give them if they wanted to maybe get their body back to what it used to be <laughs> back in their, you know, in their, let's just say in their thirties. I gave one tip. I think it'd probably focus. I mean, it depends a little bit on their diet versus what they're doing exercise wise and probably work on the one they're doing the least on. Mm -hmm. I think diet wise is probably going to be the most important piece. Um, you know, I think for me, it's eating less processed foods. And, you know, if that person's eating a lot of processed food, cutting that out will change things like crazy and they'll feel all kinds of benefits. And, you know, be it, even if they're doing, you know, carbohydrates versus not, I, I think it doesn't really matter as long as it's not super processed. I mean, I think people can do well on oatmeal and less processed foods, um, you know, and, and not just have a keto type diet, but I think eating less processed is probably my biggest tip if I had to for somebody. Yeah, totally agree with that. And, and, uh, Craig, if people want to find, are you still writing stuff? I know, um, what's the best place for people to find you? Um, I mean, if people want to email me, they can just email me at uh, craig at marker.me. Um, I okay. love talking to people about these things. I mean, I'm a researcher, so this is like fun for me to do these type of things. But I, I write for Breaking Muscle every once in a while still, uh, Strong First and T Nation. Um, so my articles kind of come out there every once in a while. So Great. Well, Craig, thank you so much for coming on. This was a lot of great information that I'm sure people can take and apply and um, I sure have. So <laughs> thanks again. It's been, for, yeah. Been my pleasure. Been fun talking with you. All right, Craig. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine. And I appreciate that. Check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode. Feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was. Thanks again and have a great day.